Wandering Oscar by Stephen Sinclair Chapter 1 His name was Wandering Oscar and he was a skeleton. He lived on a wooded hill in one of those in-between places you get in England. On one side the wood ran down to a busy road on the other fields and more woods. About three miles beyond these was a low embankment along which a branch railway line had once run. The trains had annoyed Oscar and his friends. He was glad when it closed. Beyond this the land dropped away into flat windswept country, probably once marsh, now long since drained. Then a distant line the sea. People sometimes came and cut the grass at the roadside, but nobody bothered about his hill and hardly anybody ever went there. It was a tangled rocky mass of weeds, stunted ivy chopped trees and thorn bushes with a wider more open space at the top. Oscar had lived on his hill ever since the first Elizabeth had been queen. At that time he'd lived in a cottage that had stood there in a clearing, but that was long gone. Not a trace left, and he'd only there for a few days. The spot was now all overgrown. At that time he wasn't called Wandering Oscar. His name had been Lord Henry de Quarterly, sometimes also Handsome Harry, or Harry the Devil. He'd been a tall, well-favoured young man from a wealthy family of the high gentry. A brilliant student at Oxford, and when his father died, and he inherited the lands and title, a favourite at court. Although later when the rumours started nobody would admit he had even existed, never mind that they had thought him a fine fellow and the best of company. It was once said that when he came to rule Scottish James declared that he would have had yon devil Harry quarterly hanged. Perhaps the only handsome young man the king would have condemned in this way. Chapter 2 For a time it had seemed that the world lay at his feet. Here perhaps had been the problem. Henry was enraged by the fact that this would not always be so. By the knowledge that he must grow old and die. In his arrogance and pride this offended him. What made it worse was the fact that he suspected it need not be so. His mother Margaret was a de la Poor, of the Anchester de la Poors of Hexham Priory. Always there had been stories about her family. Rumours, dark ones. Handsome Harry happened to know that the stories were substantially true. Not only had she told him things, she had shown him things. It was said that when he visited Baron Hexham, his grandfather had told him other things and that he had been initiated into the feast of the Magna Mater. It was from his mother that he first heard of the forbidden volume the Liber Nefastus Nomina, and what it was said to make possible. It's even possible she came to regret this, although she was not normally troubled by what she would have called peasant scruples. As wandering Oscar, he would often scream into the darkness of the night, consumed by unending rage, regret and pain. Why? Mother, why? Curse you! Curse you! Of course, he chose not to remember that she had warned him. She had not objected to his esoteric interests, had encouraged them. She only took exception to the direction. Said that Neoplatonist magic written by a coterie of lower empire wretches was unworthy of her son. She dismissed a book of unlawful names as essentially a Christian work. By hating the Galilean god of sheep, those foolish men entered his truth. And as I have tried to explain, Henry, there is more than one truth. If you take all their puerile symbols literally, you will bind yourself to them and make them real. Make the cursed shepherd's law true. I warn you, I whose father is lord of the twilight city and the hidden hordes of cattle and besides, she added, there are other gods than little Satan. She'd also reminded him of the terrible dangers involved if it didn't work. But Lord Henry wanted to live forever as he was then young, handsome and strong. In this world, in his terrible pride and hubris he thought the only thing abominable was the idea he wouldn't always exist. Madam, when it's the twentieth century and I rule this world as its immortal Caesar, my word shall be the only truth and law. Your family's little culinary eccentricities long forgotten. Chapter 3 Lord Henry had the wealth and influence to make his ambition come true. Not only were his lands and wealth huge, he also had a controlling share in a large percentage of the merchant ships that sailed from London and Bristol, and therefore in those days, a large share in all such profitable ventures in the world. He also correctly thought the ships would be useful in other ways. He obtained a copy of the Libra Nefastus Nomina with relative ease. A former monk had stolen a copy from one of the dissolved monasteries, 
The man, a hopeless drunk, had sold it to one of his agents for a relative pittance. The book provided a kind of hellish inventory of the various elements that were needed, and then details of the ritual to be performed. First a piece of the true cross. This had not been a great difficulty. He was a nobleman whose family was still half Catholic, half the time at least in secret. He obtained several pieces to try and ensure one was genuine. The bodies of thirteen unnatural births were also easy. Some of these were simply pulled by his minions from the Thames or bought in exchange from pennies from farms. They included a kitten with rudimentary wings, a puppy with six legs and a three-headed calf. As a crowning glory to make the spell more potent a baby with three eyes, he had the bodies pickled in vinegar and wine. The thirteen heads of evil men, killed by other evil men plus those men's lifeblood in turn, had also been relatively simple. The rookeries of London and Paris were rich hunting grounds, his hirelings well paid and indefatigable, not least because they all knew what a man like him was capable of. The next items had been more troublesome. To secure six left hands of priests of the Arian sect presented obvious problems, not the least being that as far as Lord Henry knew, they had been extinct for centuries despite what papists might say about Lutherans and other Protestants. Finally, after a long, tiring search of the continent, his agents had discovered in a miserable, incredibly remote village high in the Pyrens some extant specimens. He was also fortunate that any were alive at all, for a plague had killed all but three of the grown women and five of the men. This handful of survivors had been remarkably fair-haired for the region. He'd been tempted to think they might have vandal or gothic blood. They had survived because the place was so hard to get to, and because they were so ignorant, they didn't really understand what they were. An inscription, basically ancient graffiti on a rock beside a stream where the women drew water, non coequal pater Christus, and certain things said in their almost incomprehensible speech had sealed the fate of one old man. Selected because he sometimes led the others in prayer and could read a few words of Latin, had even knew what the words on the rock meant. Then in a fit of pique, because of the long search, Henry had them all killed. It would also, he reasoned, make it impossible for anyone else to follow my glorious experiment. There had, of course, remained the problem of the other five left hands. At first, he considered using the hands of some of the dead men in the Arian village. In the end, he decided against this course. He instead used the hands of Muhammadan imams. He reasoned that their beliefs were similar. Besides, his agents in Constantinople could get them easily. The final item had been the most difficult. At times he'd despaired that it even existed, but finally success. In the Jewish ghetto of a small city in the Rhineland, a Jewish man, who secretly was a devoted true believing baptised Catholic, that the item existed was a delightful relief. As the book instructed Henry journeyed there himself and killed the man with a stone prized from a certain wall in Jerusalem. Then he had the man burned, the ashes ground to fine powder and carried away in an earthenware jar. Chapter 4 He had now been almost ready. Nothing had been left to chance. He'd had men spy on his men, who had been spied on in turn. He had been very careful. All the elements collected were as genuine as they could be. The elements themselves by their very nature meant he had already almost succeeded. He could feel it. Inevitably, perhaps, rumours had started. There had been talk about what Henry the Devil was or was not up to. But every precaution had been taken, and besides, he reflected, he would soon be beyond what they called justice. As he told his mother, his word would soon be the truth and the law. He had enjoyed the last preparation. As the book instructed, he hunted down and killed as many of his own hirelings as possible. He was thirty-four, strong, fast, cunning, sagacious, remorseless, skilled with sword and dagger, and when the ritual was done, he would be immortal and possessed of powers undreamed of. And there was something else. He had noticed that faint reddish raised marks had begun to appear on the palm of his left hand. As of yet it was impossible to tell exactly what they were, but he thought they were numbers, or the letters that would name a certain number. He was not surprised. He sat admiring them one evening in his chambers at court. He glanced up at his face, reflected in his Venetian looking-glass. Only the other day Elizabeth herself had remarked that 
He looks a bit like father when he was young, although he's darker. This despite the gossip, it was time. Chapter 5 Lord Henry had chosen the place because the book stipulated that the ritual must be done in a place above, where the waters, earth and sky are mixed, the Fen country was perfect. He was also not likely to be disturbed, discreet inquires had revealed that the wretched spot was hardly ever visited. The cottage, although dilapidated, would serve adequately. He had first taken the skulls of the thirteen evil men, already boiled free of flesh, and baptised them each to one of the thirteen grand dukes of hell. Baptised them in the lifeblood of the equally wicked men who had killed them. The clotted blood carefully dissolved in gently warmed water that had come all the way from the river Ganges in impossibly far away India. Henry sneered happily as he performed the rite, remembering the dog who had tried to cheat him with water from the Thames. He had killed the man slowly with his dagger, to encourage the others. The skulls were then hung from a large inverted wooden cross in the clearing before the cottage. The eyeless sockets had seemed to stare at him, expectantly shadows pooling in them as the early October darkness thickened. Before the cross he had dug a pit and thrown the thirteen unnatural births into it. Lastly casting the stone, he had killed the hapless Jewish Christian with onto these and filling the hole back in. He had then made a kind of crude altar from stones atop the small mound. On the altar he placed a shallow bowl of purest silver, which he had forged with his own hands a year before on this very night. Inside this bowl lay the six cured, served left hands, the old Arian man's on top palm upwards. The withered thing cupped the pieces of true cross. Lord Henry had carefully placed four mounds of the Jew's ashes at the four points of the compass, at the distance specified by the book. He had then gone inside the cottage. The book was very clear about this. He must not look at the altar for thirteen hours. The demons must be allowed to gather in peace. It was Halloween night in the year 1567. Now it was time. Lord Henry emerged from the darkness and walked slowly around the clearing. He was nearly naked, clad only in an open robe of tanned human skin, his fiercest hirelings clasped at his neck by three ancient rusted Roman nails. The Libra Nefastus Nomina held before him, both hands on the book at arm's length. He walked slowly always from left to right. Softly he muttered foul blasphemies. Finally, after exactly thirty-three circuits of the altar, he carefully placed the book besides the silver bowl and it to the appropriate pages. Two black candles were burning, he had left nothing to chance. Loudly and clearly his voice full of passion, he began to read the ritual. He could feel the power building. Chapter 6 He was halfway through the right when it all went wrong. For a moment the marks on his left hand had tingled strangely. Then the blood boiled in Lord Henry's veins and the flesh rotted of his bones. A skeleton with bones the strange blue-white colour that only the freshest bones exposed in horrible injuries has stood screaming in mind blasting agony in the clearing. Hideous long razor-sharp claws the colour of old, yellowed ivory sprouted from the skeleton's hands and feet. Everything exploded. The upside-down cross, skulls alter the cottage. They exploded without doing any harm to the surrounding trees and plants or the ghastly undead thing that stood there howling in hellish pain and had mere moments before been handsome Harry. Then the angel appeared. The angel was huge, ten, twelve feet tall and shone golden white like the sun. The outspread wings were a dazzling prismatic spray of colours so vivid they seemed to pulse. It had a face so beautiful and symmetrical, it was almost seemed featureless. The expression of calm love and slightly pained compassion on that face was far more terrible and implacable than mere anger would have been. The thing that had been Lord Henry de Quarterly, only seconds before had a very strong will, was very strong. Despite the pain it tried to fight, it tried to call for help from the beings its mother had worshipped. Henry had always objected to those beings because they were not only indifferent about human life, but had the temerity to be indifferent about him. The angel simply raised a hand, and he was made silent. He could not move, was made still. As his mother had tried to warn him, he had now entered another house of truth. The walls had closed. Then the angel sang. The song lasted mere seconds, but it told him all. Told him what manner of thing he now was, and the adamantine rules that govern him now.
Finally, it told him there was a faint possibility of redemption and how it could be accomplished, and fell silent. He found he could move and speak again, and what the angel had told him was so terrible, especially the last part, and the pain was so bad that he cursed and screamed and blasphemed all at once. And then the thirst struck him. The thirst for living blood. Chapter 7 The creature could not move beyond a perfectly round circular area of about two miles, which had its center on its hill. If it tried it became still, and the agonizing pain it was always in reached a terrible new crescendo, which only lessened when it fled backwards. It was only able to retreat after three hours of terrible torment. When it was near the boundary the pain in the palm of its left hand was abominable. There were the raised marks of letters on the bony palm asinus fool. When it was newly made, it had rampaged screaming through the fields and woods, had run howling into the nearest village at the edge of the fens, a tiny hamlet. It was intent on killing. It would glut on the people's blood, quench the terrible thirst, rub their flesh into its aching bones. Once his Lord Henry had gone to a barber surgeon to have a tooth pulled. That pain had been bad, but now all his bones, which was all that was left of him now, felt like that all over. It came in pulsing waves, as if to the beat of the heart he no longer had. The hateful angel had told him that only flesh would ease the pain. He had however also discovered that the other things it had told him were also true. He could not harm the villagers. Couldn't, because none of them had done murder. Wakened by the horrible creature's screams the people fled when they saw him in a terror-stricken stampede. Only the old priest had not run. A kindly old cynic of ninety years who having survived all the many natural and unnatural things that killed you in those days, as well as the political and religious vastitudes, long ago he had decided privately they were the same thing, and that God also understood this, of the times had only been mildly surprised at the sight of the fright that howled and gibbered in the middle of the village's only street in the light of the full moon. Surprised in much the same way he would have been of mobile phones and computers. Besides, he was a married man, and immediately his first thought had been for his sick wife, who lay asleep beside him, despite all the noise. He opened the window and loudly said the Our Father, and made the sign of the cross in the air. The creature screamed even louder and fled into one of the houses. They discovered latter it had tried to make a weapon of fire from the hearth, probably to burn the village. But the fire, never put out in the normal course of life whatever the time of year, had died out at its touch. It had scattered the dead embers in its rage. When the priest continued to pray it fled. Howling in pain, skeletal hands held over non-existent ears, blundering into walls as if blind. Then gone. Chapter 8 The old priest explained to the people what manner of fright the creature was. He told them it was a vaga osseous evocator, and explained what this meant. He reassured them that the monster could also not harm the pure of heart. Further, that this meant murderers, rather than people who strayed into the woods together when nobody was looking. He knew them well. Partly because of the strange Latin words and partly because of the meaning they had, the people began to call the thing Wandering Oscar. They avoided the hill and the fields around it, where the creature mainly lurked. Although it couldn't physically harm, it could and did drive people mad or to death with fright. In time they became rather proud of having such a fearsome local denizen. Like all country people they loved a fearsome bugbear to add colour to their lives. Lord Henry's horse was found wandering five miles from the hill. Also, certain books and papers were found in Henry's rooms at court. This and the rumours off the fiend were why Lord Henry was never mentioned by most people ever again. What had been Lord Henry de Quarterly and was now wandering Oscar discovered that he could not move about during the daylight hours. It wasn't that he would be killed by the light. He simply lost control of himself of all his limbs and was compelled to bury himself under leaves and earth. The best of could manage was to walk about for a time in summer twilight. Then there was the matter of Oscar's friends. He had first killed a fox, caught the beast and sunk all his claws into it, and sucked the blood through these into himself, crouched on the animal like a huge cackling spider. Then he'd torn the flesh apart and rubbed it all over himself. A pain had eased. He threw the bones away. A few months later, when he emerged from the earth at nightfall, a skeleton fox had trotted lightly up to him out of the trees, 
its tail wagging. This happened with all his kills. The hill crawled with undead creatures. Everything from birds and bats to cats and dogs. There were animate skeletons of deer and even snakes. Fortunately, the exception was the human murderers he claimed over the centuries. Always the wrong kind. They stayed dead. His friend's hunger was different from his. Nor did they appear to be in pain. What they yearned for, apparently, was always to be near Oscar. They followed him maddeningly. They nuzzled him revoltingly and slid against him objectionably. Although he found he could control them to some extent with his mind, he could not get rid of them. He tried breaking, smashing, scattering the skeletons of fresh kills, but they simply reformed. Wandering Oscar was always in pain. Always. Sometimes it was simply worse than at other times. And he could not go mad. He'd tried. Knew it was a way out. But he could not go mad any more than he could die. It was as if his mind was like one of those flies that are trapped in amber. What was worse was that part of him was somehow still alive. Truly alive. Chapter 9 Pain. Loneliness. Despair and rage. Always the rage. And hate. Burning hate. His suffering was like a sea with no shore, and he floated there. On and on through the endless years. From his hill he looked on as the world changed, and the changes were pointless, and he hated the pointless changes. The village where the old priest had driven him away was long gone, and the wonders that he saw appear like the train and the horseless carriages were not really wonders at all. They were only stinking contrivances made by trivial fools. People had always been fools. He wished he could leave the boundary and kill them all. The fools who lived in the years after his own time increasingly lived lives of abject luxury and abundance. Not even the royalty of his own day could have imagined it. He noticed that they were so embarrassed by plenty that they had begun to throw things away. Sometimes they even threw away books and big flapping bits of paper with printed words on them. Paper had been rare in his day. From these he learned things, and in other ways. Sometimes Oscar had only to look or touch something, and it spoke to him. What he discovered increasingly disgusted him. The lower orders were being allowed to run loose. The English language itself had become a peasant jargon and doggerel. The world had become fat and ugly. In time he was forgotten. A stupid story not even remembered. In a rather poor book of folklore in the British Library, he was mentioned almost as a footnote. That was all. Inevitably the most salient points of his existence were his human prey. Both because of hatred and because human blood and flesh eased the agony the most. The first was a man who'd killed his wife and foolishly staggered into the fields swigging cider from a jug. The earthenware pot still lay where it had fallen, now covered by the earth. Another time a wealthy woman had gone riding and got lost. A few years before she smothered her old father-in-law with a pillow. As the woman rode past a horde of skeletal things had burst from a hedge, and she was thrown from her mount. Wandering Oscar had then emerged from the undergrowth. By this time, he was a filthy unclean thing clothed in a weird assortment of decaying rags. Over his bare skull hung an old torn potato sack. For some reason, although he could not make or touch fire without it going out, he sometimes felt cold. His bare skull and body were now also covered in a layer of rotting flesh. In places it crawled with maggots and mould. In his empty eye sockets cat-like pupils now glowed like green eldritch fire. He had been very thirsty. The woman did not last long. Like most of them, she'd been lucky and had gone stark raving mad. There had been many others. Perhaps the most memorable had been to two men who had crawled from a crashed flying machine. The men had been the only survivors. The machine had been dropping things that were made to explode on London. The men thought of themselves as Germans. In Oscar's time Germany had been a collection of petty little states. It was where other people's armies went to fight, and where young men of his class had martial adventures they could then boast about in later years. For a moment he'd been offended in a way that was almost human. He might not have been able to take them. Soldiers had a special status within the rules. But these men had, in smaller flying machines, murdered people who had been fleeing fighting. Did this deliberately and with pleasure. He drained one quickly. The other had reminded him somewhat of one of Lord Henry's hirelings. The German was a great peasant brute from Danzig, 
Oscar did not like people from Danzig. Lord Henry's father's steward had once told him all the citizens of the free city were liars and cheats. Furthermore, he saw the man was a true believer and follower of the stupid low-born cur who he thought of as Der Führer, who had sent him to drop the things on London. Oscar also found that this Der Führer was a man who did not like wenching or sighting over his wine and who kept a table only fit for a rabbit. He was also a bohemian papist. Wandering Oscar had let the man strike him, throw him about. Oscar was very light. Sometimes he could jump from tree to tree onto very thin branches or let himself be carried somewhat on the wind. The man had been so stupid, such a peasant brute, that he did not go mad. It was only when he stamped, with heavy boots, full force, and the thing's bones did not break, that the man began to cry and whimper. Finally, Oscar had rooted himself to the spot and grabbed the man with one hand. Oscar did this very easily as he was at least fifty times as strong as the strongest human being. He had then snapped the man's wrists and ankles, clicked his fingers so that some ivy came to life and bound him. He then enjoyed himself, played. This had involved the man, two of Oscar's snakes, and a weasel. The man was his dinner for a week. The creature now only thought of himself as wandering Oscar. Chapter 10 a mere five years or so after the incident with the men from the flying machine Oscar emerged from under a pile of leaves into the twilight of end of a long summer's day. All the undead skeleton animals also woke up and silently emerged into the gathering shadows. Oscar had happened to glance up at the branch of a tree where a blackbird had its nest. It had been the received wisdom when he'd been a human being that animals and birds avoided places where things like he now was lurked. He had never found this to be the case. The blackbird was perched on a branch, and he could feel the little creature's thoughts. Confusion and a sense of distress. The bird's feelings were already fading, would soon fade to merciful nothingness. All the chicks were dead, drowned. There had been summer thunderstorm during the day, a real cloud burst. How many times over the centuries had he seen birds like this? They died and were replaced by others of the same kind. He had killed them countless times form pure spite, smashed and scattered the nests. They came back. They would come again, futile little things that tried to care and protect other, even littler and more helpless things. And somehow these thoughts became mixed with thoughts of the Germans from the flying machine. And thoughts of Lord Henry, who he loathed now with all his being. From Lord Henry to the equally disgusting man who had sent the German flyers forth. Then back to the blackbird again, who had now flown away. Somehow all this made him think of something that had happened not long after he had seen the first of the horseless carriages. Early on one evening like this, a little boy had wandered near the base of the hill. He'd been playing with a stick, happily prattling to himself, and sometimes stopping to make marks in the earth with the stick. He was a swarthy foreign-looking little fellow, probably one of the gypsies who sometimes travelled through the region at that time. In life Lord Henry had had no interest in children. They had simply been incomplete versions of the people he believed it was his right to command. Besides, they bored him, and in those days died like flies. But wandering Oscar had come down the hill and suddenly stood gibbering before the child. He'd had some of his dogs appear with their bare snapping, clacking jaws. The boy had had a fit. Lay on the ground and shook and jerked like a landed fish. Oscar had then simply left him there. When he came back in the dawn, the child was gone. No doubt he'd been found, as no doubt he'd spent the rest of his life if he lived in voiceless imbecility. The thoughts and memories turned in his mind, and although he hated modern English, he remembered part of a poem he had read in a book one of the spoiled soft moderns had thrown from a horseless carriage. He had thought the poems was almost good. He said some of it aloud, yet each man kills the thing he loves. All Lord Henry had ever loved was himself and he had destroyed himself long ago. In his strange, hissing, sibilant voice, Oscar softly said, Although I was a soul in pain, the blackbird flew back to its nest. Oscar fell to his knees. His pain had been a sea, but a final drop had fallen, and it became an ocean. All the oceans, and out of the depths something rose that swamped and bore under the hate and the rage. It was an ark. It had been made over a very long time, made unsuspected, 
of heavy timbers sadness, regret and most surprisingly of all contrition. Terrible contrition, it had taken a long time. There had not been much in Henry de Quarterly to work with. The physical pain remained, but this arc rose and floated atop the ocean of misery. Although he had no real eyes, real tears flowed from the empty sockets. I am so very sorry. He was. Chapter 11 That had been at least fifty years ago. During that time, he did not let people see him. There had only been one murderer. A man who had murdered another man for that most unoriginal of reasons. A woman. As in so many other ways, the modern people had become, it seemed, in this respect lazy and soft. In much the same way as they hardly ever walked about any more as compared to their ancestors. Chapter 12 For a few years Oscar had been aware that someone had been burying things nearby. At least four, maybe five. He knew what the things were, but only roughly like a thing seen from the corner of the eye. The things lay a few tantalizing miles beyond the barrier. Several times he felt a presence that made him very hungry, but always likewise on the wrong side of the barrier. Then one night he was down beside the new road, the little one that led to the new unlovely white boxy dwellings with the ridiculous name of bungalows, built a tiny thirty years before the road and houses were just outside Oscar's territory. Oscar was looking at one of the papery things, reading comfortably in the darkness. He had just had a rabbit and his pain was eased. He had reached the point now after nearly five centuries where the pain was sometimes like an annoying itch. In the papery thing one of the artisans who tended the horseless carriages was complaining, the problem was always the parts. Oscar nodded in agreement, and all his friends nodded too. He had always suspected it had been the Muhammadan hands. Then he had sensed the homicide, knew that the killer was coming back from the place where the things were buried, to where he lived tantalizingly close. The little road to the ugly white dwellings joined the big road in a location frustratingly away from Oscar's hill and the area he could roam in. But here on in this small rising field they were both visible. The murderer passed by in a shiny red horseless carriage. They opened one of the red carriage's windows and threw something out. The something fell just inside the barrier. The man was florid faced with white hair and beard. Rather than going near and becoming still, Oscar sent a fox to retrieve it. Soon the fox was back and dropped it at his feet. It was he supposed a kind of poppet, but it was made like a ridiculous realization of a pink bear. He had seen such things before and thought them in poor taste. He associated bears with dogs and pits, trips to body houses. He picked it up and it spoke to him. He knew, knew everything. The man who had discarded it like trash was one of those fellows who was the jolliest, Frenchiest of loud jack of the town, fellow well met, back slappers to some, to others, his underlings and those he considered weaker tartar. A terror. He would be a crawling sycophantic piece of night soil to those he considered above. To Lord Henry he would have got down and kissed the ground in front of him, but also betrayed him without a second's thought if the opportunity had presented. He also knew what else the man was. Knew what he had done. He had done the things far from home and buried what was left where he had as trophies, so he could be nearby and come and gloat. Oscar's chance had come. Finally, after all these years, he was glad it was a man like this. Oscar had no mill wheel, there was not even one left from the old times. But one of the wheels from one of the big carriages lay in a ditch. He could fill it with stones. He also had no way to get near the sea, but an old, flooded quarry lay to the west. It would serve. Chapter 13 Mr. Simon Beale was a worried man. No, he thought, not worried, frightened. All his life his response to fear had also been anger. People had been seeing things, things. By the road down to his house, mortgage nearly paid up, in the field on the slight rise they said they had seen a little girl, some distance back, a little girl in a reddish dress. She was said to have blonde hair, and she had been waving, holding something. When people had gone to investigate, they found nothing, nothing. There had even been a thing in the local paper. There was even talk about ghosts, although the area was described as not a hot spot for paranormal activity. Simon rarely read books, but a few years before he had avidly read a book by a celebrated scientist. The book was about how certain things could absolutely, 
categorically, not be. He had read and said to himself again and again, that's it, exactly what I think. It was true. He had rejected these things ever since he had prayed the God of his grandparents for things he wanted and nothing happened. And he had come to reject them for other reasons. As he got older, now he had started to think things he considered weak. And he wasn't weak. And he was getting angry. So enough was enough. He would go and have a look. He happened to know the sightings seemed to be happening on certain dates. It was one of the most disturbing things about the entire business. As was the colour of the dress and the colour of the girl's hair. Besides, there were always other reasons for him to go and look at a place where a child was. Somehow, he wasn't surprised when he saw her. A small figure far too narrow-shouldered to be an adult. In the gathering gloom, it was difficult to make out details. He parked the car and got out and climbed over the fence. A warm summer evening. Getting late, he walked into the field and waved back. Called out reassuringly in a friendly voice. He got to a kind of dip and lost sight of her. Climbed up and almost laughed. It was an old scarecrow in red rags with some yellow rags on its head. He almost laughed with relief. It must have been blowing in the wind. He wondered what it was doing there. There had never been any crops in the field. But do scarecrows have for heads a dirty skull thing with evil glowing green eyes? Do they stand up tall and rip the old red towel and yellow rags they have disguised themselves with away? Do they howl in triumph? He was trying to run when the horrible thing raised a skeleton hand and clicked its fingers. A kind of huge hood of tangled, moving, writhing bones rose. It seemed to flow up from the ground. With the clarity that sometimes comes with stark terror, he registered that it jumped with hundreds of little things that looked like skeleton mice and rats. They were like fleas on the hide of a huge beast. Then the hood fell on him and swept him away. He came to in a clearing. Trees all round, lying on a bit of stony weedy ground. It was nearly full dark. Simon had spent a short, ill-advised time in the army. People had told him what to do all the time. Him, mortgage nearly paid up. Also, certain opportunities he had believed would exist did not. Some of the people who had told him what to do had been men from what was once called old families. He had hated them all. They all walked with a certain indefinable way about them. An infuriating aura, and the horrible thing that now emerged from the trees and walked towards him moved in that same indefinable way. Even the way it adjusted the rotting black rags that clothed it was the same. He found he couldn't move. Horrible bone things held him down. He tried to scream, and a thing bite his tongue. It tasted of dirt and chalk. He lost control of his body. The walking thing with green eyes reached him, and spoke. Thou shalt now go to hell forevermore. For you there is no redemption. The words were spoken in a hissing voice that was somehow matter of fact. And hell is deep. Simon did manage to speak then. He whimpered, Mummy. At this the horrible thing struck him a terrible backhanded blow that shattered his jaw and laid the flesh open to the teeth in ragged strips. Chapter 14 The man was dead, with the wheel full of stones round his neck the body at the bottom of the flooded quarry. It was nearly dawn and Oscar would have to go into the ground. He climbed back up the hill to his clearing, and all his friends fell to the ground and stopped moving. They began to disappear, to turn to dust. For a moment he felt them, felt the terrible tiredness of the long, long years. For just a moment he also felt them as they had once been long ago. Little blind things curled up inside their mothers, things that hardly moved inside eggs hooves that had only floated in warm water, then sleep and peace, they were gone. He was dazzled by the rising sun and help up a hand to shield his face against the light. And it was a real hand, with skin and flesh. Incredulously, he felt his face. He had a face again. Lord Henry de Quarterly stood silent in the clearing, starring in amazement at his own hands. He was dressed as he had been long ago in his old court clothes. It was some time before he noticed the children. A boy and a girl stood near him holding hands. The little girl was about eight and clutched a ridiculous poppet of an animal. The boy was the same one he had frightened into a fit in the woods all those years before. Lord Henry fell to his knees before the boy. He tried to speak. The child laid a hand on his shoulder. It's done, Henry. Come with us. 
We are going on a journey. They walked from the clearing. Behind them something turned to dust and blew away in the dawn breeze. 